morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Zinc Lassamoa. In for Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, final push. Less than three weeks until the critical midterms. President Biden is joining the campaign trail. He'll be in Pennsylvania stumping for Senate candidate John Fetterman, where that critical race now stands. Plus, the new polling showing which candidates are ahead in other critical swing states like Florida. Alarming move. Russian President Vladimir Putin declares martial law in the four Ukrainian regions he illegally annexed, essentially making them police states. What this means for the people living there and how the Ukrainian government is responding this morning as Russia continues its attacks across the country. New rules with inflation taking a big bite out of American wallets. There's a rare bit of good news from the IRS. We'll break down the new tax rules and how you may soon be getting more money back in those tax returns. Plus, from the stage to the front lines, K-pop group BTS is taking a hiatus from the music world while they serve in the South Korean Army. We'll show you what's behind South Korea's mandatory military service and where the band is headed next. I love a good boy band. <laughs> <laughs> I do really? BTS. Who's your favorite? In, in sync. In sync. Actually, that's, that's a good I, one. I'll confess. That's, Backstreet's good too. Bye though. bye bye. That's my first concert. Actually, it oh was in sync. I know. We'll I talk. love that for we'll you. Talk. We'll talk. <laughs> but first, we begin this morning with the final push ahead of the 2022 midterms, with early voting now underway in many states from coast to coast. Today, President Biden will hit the campaign trail with John Fetterman. The Pennsylvania Democrat is locked in a close race with Dr. Mehmet Oz, the celebrity TV personality who has been backed by former President Trump. Taking a look at the polls this morning, the economy and inflation are among voters' top concerns this election season. Republicans holding a slight advantage over Democrats when voters were asked which party they would prefer to handle each issue. At stake, of course, control of Congress. Right now, the Democrats hold a slight lead in the House of Representatives. While well, the Senate is deadlocked right down the middle with Vice President Kamala Harris giving Democrats the slightest of edges. We've got full team coverage this morning with NBC News Washington correspondent Amy Shell Sindor and NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray. So, Mark, let's start with you. As I mentioned, President Biden is going to visit Pennsylvania today to stump for the lieutenant governor, John Fetterman, who's locked in a heated Senate contest with Republican challenger Dr. Oz. A new AARP poll found that the state, looking at the state, found that Fetterman and Oz are really polling within the margin of error, so a statistical tie. What kind of impact do you think President Biden's visit will have here, considering most Democrats really aren't asking for for his help on the trail. Yeah, Joe, and what uh, President Biden is actually doing is attending a fundraiser for John Fetterman. It's not one of those kind of big rallies that we'd often see former President Donald Trump do for Republican candidates or even former President Barack Obama for Democratic candidates. Joe Biden's kind of had a different approach where he's actually been raising money. He's been holding speeches in Washington, D.C., as we heard uh, earlier this week um, on the issue of abortion. He's been talking about the infrastructure law, as well as reducing health care costs from the White House, talking about energy prices from the White House, going to Oregon and California. But he really hasn't been holding the big kind of rallies that we'd often see in the key battleground states. And even though President Biden is going to one of the marquee contests this entire midterm cycle, it's not necessarily one of those big rallies rallies that we're accustomed to. And Mark, I want to move to the Midwest, where candidates in Wisconsin's gubernatorial race are now actually pulling neck and neck with their first debate set for tonight. And we're also seeing Republican Senator Ron Johnson in a tight race of his own there. So what should we be watching for in what's really a critical swing state? I love the term that you just used, neck and neck, because that almost <laughs> describes every Wisconsin race over the past decade. And of course, we ended up seeing uh, President Biden win Wisconsin by about 10,000 votes in 2020. We saw former President Donald Trump win Wisconsin, vote, uh, Wisconsin by about 10,000 votes. Every race in Wisconsin comes down to one or two percentage points. And we knew this going into the cycle and both the gubernatorial race as well as that Senate contest between Senator Ron Johnson and Democrat Mandela Barnes is going to be incredibly tight in maybe the most polarized state over the past decade. And Mark, let's look big picture here. Democrats are trying to buck the trend of the majority party losing power after the midterms. We're seeing some Republicans in much tighter races than maybe you would historically expect in a midterm like this. So what are you watching for now from both sides in this home stretch? Yeah, Joe, one thing that makes this midterm cycle different than the others I've covered is just the sheer unpopularity 
of so many candidates, Democratic or Republican. And so you end up looking in places like Iowa, where that's a now a comfortably red Republican state, but incumbent Senator Chuck Grassley is in a really close contest, according to a recent uh, Des Moines Register poll. Uh, similarly, you end up having a situation where the incumbent governor of uh, in Oklahoma, Kevin Stitt, Oklahoma is a really big Republican state, but he's in a close contest as well, too. And some Republicans are being just kind of dragged down by the sheer unpopularity. Voters are unhappy with everybody right now. And then, of course, you know, the, you, I still think that the favorites to win re-election are Stitt in Oklahoma and Grassley in Iowa. But the fact that there are so many people who are unhappy and they're unpopular politicians from both sides make it a tough environment to, to run for re-election. Well, 19 days away, we'll be watching closely. Mark Murray, thank you so much. A federal judge is ordering an ex-lawyer of former President Trump to turn over dozens of new documents to the January 6th committee. Some of those documents from Trump's former attorney, John Eastman, include emails allegedly showing efforts to disrupt the confirmation of the former president's loss back in 2020. The judge ruled the documents must be handed over to the committee because they are related to an attempted crime exempt from any sort of attorney-client privileges. The judge also said that Trump was aware that the number of voter fraud cases he alleged in a lawsuit challenging George's election results were inaccurate. Eastman invoked the Fifth Amendment when he testified before a grand jury back in August. We're also taking a closer look this morning at election security ahead of the midterms, a polarizing topic of discussion in the wake of the 2020 election. And it's also the focus of the latest installment of Meet the Press reports airing tonight right here on NBC News Now. So let's bring in NBC News Washington correspondent Yamiche Alcindor for a preview. It's so good to see you. So what have the implications been of Florida's so-called election police force, Yamiche? Can you first explain what exactly they're doing there and the effect you're seeing it have on voters specifically? Well, good morning, Zeke It's a critical question because my story for Meet the Press reports really centers on this fact. The false claim that the 2020 election was stolen has now become a top and critical GOP talking point, part of the party's larger approach to elections post-2020. National organizations are recruiting poll workers and poll watchers to become part of the election systems across this country, so part of the people counting the ballots this November. The state Republican and state Republican officials have also been using their power to pass new laws that critics say will be critical in restricting voting access, making it easier to overturn election results, and criminalizing voting in unfair ways. In Florida, in particular, which is what you asked me about, Republican Governor Ron DeSantis signed a bill in April to create an election police force dedicated to pursuing voter fraud. So far, at least 20 people have been arrested by the unit. Here's a clip featuring the Florida Secretary of State, an interview that I did with him defending the state's actions. In Florida, Republican Governor Ron DeSantis signed a bill in April to create an election police force dedicated to pursuing voter fraud. So far, at least 20 people have been arrested by the unit. When you don't enforce your laws, you, you encourage more bad behavior. What do you say to critics who say that the Office of Election Crimes and Security, what some have called the election police force, that that was created to establish a false narrative, a political narrative uh, about a problem that doesn't really exist? Yeah, I mean, I think that's just completely inaccurate and belies the truth that there are people that, that vote that aren't entitled to vote. And every single person that votes that shouldn't uh, undermines someone who do, who uh, the legal vote of someone else. Byrd said the unit is looking at the whole state, but he added that there will be more issues in bigger counties like Miami-Dade, Broward, Hillsborough, and Duval. So it's just a coincidence right now that you're starting with mostly Democratic, heavily no, populated not, areas. Which I, is I know what you're trying to say, and that, or, that's, not, more that's, more that's, not, what that's yeah. not what I'm saying. Is that that's where the volume is? I mean, Miami-Dade County has a million and a half voters. So when critics look at that and say you're going after Democratic-led counties, Democratic-leaning counties, your response is absolutely false. But advocates say those arrested did not know they were breaking the law, and that in many cases, government officials had sent them voting materials that allowed them to cast ballots. A number of lawyers for those arrested told us they are fighting the charges in court. None of these folks should have been arrested in the first place.
So there you have it, really, the advocates saying that there were, these are people who did not know they were breaking the law. In many cases, you had sta uh, the state of Florida mailing them voting materials in this case. So people were registering to vote and then getting letters from the state, at least what attorneys told me, and then casting their ballots. And then only years and years or months later were they then arrested in, the, in those really shocking videos that were put out by the Tampa Bay Times. I mean, incredibly engaging conversation and reporting also, Yamisha. I know that there are also so called MAGA, Make America Great Again poll watchers. So, can you talk to us about that? Because we've talked about the so called election police. What are they doing in the midterm election, and what's their role as people head out to vote pretty soon? Well, we have these outside organizations, including one headed up by Cleta Mitchell, who was a lawyer, former lawyer for former President Trump, who was trying to overturn the 2020 election. She is now, with a number of other people, trying to organize poll watchers. Um, and they're essentially trying to get people to be the ones that are counting the ballots, conservatives who are counting the ballots. There are some election officials who tell me they're worried about nefarious actors infiltrating their systems. Of course, some Republicans told me that they just want to see how all of this works. They want to take this into account. They don't want to meddle with things. They just want to see how things work. But, of course, the, the real worry here is that things will get too far, that people will get heated, and that Republicans will not want to see Democratic ballots cast. They'll challenge those. And there is some worry that maybe Democratic poll watchers might do the same for Republicans, even though I have to tell you, it's on the Republican side that we're seeing the election deniers and most of the lies about the election. And Yamish, briefly here, the thread has been election fraud. So how widespread is the belief of election fraud among not candidates, um, excuse me, not voters, but candidates specifically who are running for office this year? What you're seeing in the Republican Party right now are 2022 candidates leaning in on the election lies of 2020, leaning in on the language of former President Trump, who was continuing to say that the 2020 election was stolen, even though it was free and fair. And there are a number of Republicans, including former Attorney General Bill Barr, who said they looked into these claims and that they were false. But I found a number of candidates, including Carrie Lake in Arizona, who's running for governor, and a number of other candidates who are on the campaign trail, standing alongside former President Trump and making these false claims. And I have to tell you, it's impacting voters um, and a lot of people wanting to go and stand by um, drop boxes. One voter told me that he was going to go and take his sidearm, that means a weapon, a gun, to drop boxes to watch them. So it's a little scary and dangerous out there for poll workers and poll watchers. High stake times. High stake times. And Michelle Sindor in Washington, thank you so much. And a programming reminder to everyone, you can watch Meet the Press report securing the vote tonight at 10.30 p.m. Eastern here on NBC News Now. You can also watch it on demand the next day on Peacock. President Biden says the U.S. will once again tap into the country's oil reserves in effort to help lower fuel prices. The move comes as gas prices have spiked back up in recent weeks. AAA says the national average is now $3.83, which is actually down from last week, but it's still up about 16 cents from last month after more than three months of declining. For more on this, let's bring in NBC News White House reporter Lauren Egan. Lauren, good morning to you. So OPEC announced earlier this month that it would actually cut oil production by 2 million barrels a day. President Biden criticized that decision, calling it short-sighted. So talk to us about the president's decision to dip into the oil reserve again. What's the strategy here? That's right. The president, in his speech at the White House yesterday, announced that he was going to be authorizing the sale of an additional 15 million barrels of oil from the reserve. Now, the reserve are these big caverns that sit along the coast in Texas uh, and Louisiana. And when they're full, they can hold about 620 uh, million barrels of oil. Today, we're down to about 400 million barrels. So in that speech yesterday, the president also made another announcement. He said that his administration was going to start taking steps to refill that reserve. That's important for two reasons. One, obviously, national security issue. If we were to have some sort of major crisis, you'd want to make sure that those reserves were as full as possible. But it also sends an important message to the oil industry. Essentially, President Biden was saying to the domestic oil producers, start pumping more oil. There is going to be someone there to purchase it, meaning the U.S. government is going to be in the future buying back millions of these barrels of oil to refill, uh, to refill that reserve. Take a listen to what the president had to say about this topic at the White House yesterday. We're producing 12 million barrels of oil per day. And by the end of this year, we will be producing one million barrels a day, more than the day in which I took office. Today, the United States is the largest producer of oil and petroleum products in the world. We export more than we import. 
So as you can see there, a big part of the president's strategy is continuing to put some pressure on oil companies to try and ramp up production here in the U.S., Joe. And Lauren, I mean, we also heard President Biden call on Congress to improve energy production. What exactly does that mean? What's he looking to accomplish here? That's right. The president uh, in that speech yesterday said, look, I want there to be more oil production in the U.S. now to help address this issue of uh, high energy costs. But that doesn't mean that I'm abandoning my push for more green energy. The president has said we can walk and, ch and chew gum at the same time. And he's framed it a little bit as a national security issue. The White House has essentially said, look, we wouldn't be in this situation right now if we had more green energy in the U.S. right now. Uh, the president also addressed this topic in that same speech yesterday. Let's take another listen to what he had to say. The process of getting clean energy projects approved is too cumbersome and too time consuming. So I'm asking the Congress pass a permitting bill to speed up the approval of all kinds of energy production from wind to solar to clean hydrogen. If we do this, it would take historic clean energy investments that I signed into law and put them into action. Right after that speech yesterday, the president held another event in which he announced $2.8 billion in investment uh, for 12 different states to help boost production of batteries that are used in electric vehicles. So as you can see, a big theme here is energy independence, Joe. And very quickly, Lauren, if we don't see much of a dip in gas prices, does the president have any other tools at his disposal? He said that he would consider tapping into the reserve again. He's definitely going to continue pressuring oil companies publicly. But to a certain extent, the oil markets are a global market, and there's always going to be some volatility uh, inherent in them. All right, Lauren Egan, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And turning to Ukraine this morning, the pro-Russian administration in Kherson has begun to evacuate civilians ahead of a widely anticipated offensive by Ukrainian forces. That's as nationwide curbs on electricity usage come into effect today following a series of Russian strikes on energy facilities. Authorities are warning people to prepare for rolling blackouts. NBC News correspondent Cal Perry has the latest from Kyiv. Fresh strikes overnight. Once again, the target, the energy infrastructure of this country, though sometimes the missiles miss and they hit residential targets, as was the case earlier this week here in Kyiv. And so the mayor is pleading with residents, turn off your electricity, save your power. This as the weather has changed here, the temperature dropping drastically overnight. And so we see this long-term goal by Russia to not just hit the energy infrastructure targets, but to strike at the civilians who live in this country. It has long been their goal to try to break the back of the civilian population, not just here in the capital, but across the country. Strikes overnight in the southern city of Mykolaiv and overnight in the northern part of the country as well. Officials here are asking for help from around the world for a air defense system, an improvement to the existing air defense systems. Israel is the latest country to offer a helping hand, saying they'll provide that early alert system, holding off on the ammunition needed to fire and actually shoot those drones down. Officials here hoping very much the United States will supply that. Cal Perry, NBC News, Kiev. Now back to the U.S. for a check at your morning news now weather. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman is with us with the forecast. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Good morning, guys. Great to see you. And it's still cold. We're yeah. on our third day. <laughs> really it. cold weather, but things are improving. <laughs> this is the last morning of bitterly cold weather. We're going to start to see our rebound. But still 76 million Americans waking up to freezing temperatures. Where you see this hole here doesn't mean they're not waking up to freezing temperatures. It means their growing season is over. So everywhere else, we're looking at freeze warnings, frost advisories. Where you see this hot pink color, that's from the Ohio Valley down to the south. Southeast, the Gulf Coast states, into portions of the Carolinas, New England, Northeast. We are looking at freeze warnings this morning. So many of us waking up again to freeze alerts. This is a setup once again. It's sort of a repeat performance of yesterday, the day before. We had that jet stream so far to the south. It's staying cool today, but things will be changing as we go throughout the next couple of days. Back to the west, we're starting to warm. To the extreme west, we've been really warm, way above uh, record highs uh, the past few days. And But we're starting to warm in the middle of the country here. So Dallas, 83 degrees at 6 degrees above normal for this time of year. They were chilly yesterday. They were chilly the day before. So this is just a preview of what's going to move to the east. But we're still chilly in Buffalo today, 46 degrees. 
sunsets 12 degrees below what is typical for this time of year. Chattanooga also in the 60s, 68 degrees in Mobile and Jacksonville, Florida, you're only in the 60s today. So there's that jet stream to the north lifted so high that's bringing in that warm southerly flow and that's why we're seeing temperatures into the 70s, into the 80s. Dallas today, 88 degrees, big improvement over yesterday. That's about uh, 12 degrees above normal for this time of year. San Antonio, 86 degrees, and we're seeing mild as we go throughout early next week. Temperatures in the 70s in Cincinnati into the 80s over the weekend in portions of the south. So we're improving. Pattern change, we're going to kind of flip-flop. We have that jet stream dip to the south today uh, in the east. But look what happens as we go throughout early next week. It shifts. So we're going to bring in that cooler air into the northwest. There's that big flip, 10 to 25 degrees, uh, temperature plum plunge in the west. And then on the flip side, in the east of the Rockies, we are looking at 10 to 20 degrees above average. Average. It's all due to this area of low pressure finally moving off, but still bringing the chance for some rounds of showers, some wet snowflakes in the Great Lakes, but that's going to move further away and that's going to improve conditions. So the chill easing in the east, it's warm in the central plains, sunny and warm in the southwest. Temperatures near 90 degrees today in Los Angeles, and we do have a fire risk in the Intermountain West to critical levels, and that's because we have low humidity, we have some gusty winds in place, and it's really dry too. So 9 million impacted. Where you see the red, that's your red flag warning. That's portions of the Intermountain West, also portions of the Ohio Valley, too. So what that means is you just have to be careful. Everything's really dry, so if you light a match or you ignite something, it could spread very, very fast. Important to be careful. Mm -hmm. You might notice here, this is not a coincidence, we are all wearing purple this morning. That is because today is Spirit Day. It's to show support for LGBTQ youth and take a stand against bullying. We're going to talk more with Glad about that coming up next hour. And to be kind. Yeah, kind. solidarity. Always yes. important. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, thank, thank you, you Michelle. Sure. Violence rocks the largest jail in Myanmar. NBC's Claudia Lavanga joins us from Rome with this and other international headlines. Claudia, good morning. Good morning, guys. Yes, state media in Myanmar says that a series of bombs hidden in parcels exploded in the country's biggest prison, killing eight people and injuring 18 others. In a statement posted on social media, an armed anti-junta group said that they took responsibility and that it was in retaliation against the junta chief in the country. Now, the prison is also where thousands of political prisoners were sent since last year's military coup. Now, let's go to Zimbabwe, which has become the first African country to approve an HIV prevention drug recommended by the World Health Organization. AIDS-related deaths in Zimbabwe have fallen from an estimated 130,000 in 2002 to 20,000 in 2021. Last year, it launched a strategic plan to end AIDS by 2030. The WHO says that the country's approval uh, of the drug is a crucial step in the fight against AIDS. And let's go to New Zealand, finally, where farmers demonstrated against government plans to tax cow burps, among other greenhouse gas emissions. The farmers took to the streets with their tractors in 50 towns across the island, although the rallies were smaller than expected. Methane from burping cattle makes a big contribution to greenhouse gases, but farmers in New Zealand say they don't want to cough up the new tax, guys. All right, an issue I've never thought of before. <laughs> the Galadio, thank you so much. And now to South Korea, where a decades-old law is in the spotlight this morning thanks to K-pop sensation BTS. The band's label announced that all seven members will be taking time off from music to fulfill their mandatory military service. NBC News Now anchor Aaron Gilchrist takes a look at the history of Korea's conscription system. South Korean boy band BTS is going from the big stage to the barracks. The K-pop group announcing on Monday that each member will serve in South Korea's military. Victor Cha is an NBC News contributor on Asian affairs. It's roughly the equivalent of when Elvis Presley uh, went into the military. Elvis Presley no longer has that rock and roll beat. The tempo is hup, two, three, four for Private Presley. And he chose at the height of his popularity uh, to serve in the military. South Korean law mandates that most able-bodied men perform at least 18 months of military service. Harry Song served in the Army from 2016 to 2018. He remembers his service as a time of personal growth. I was kind of forced in this environment where I was able to really make my own decisions and make my own calls and really think about what I wanted. Um, I stopped thinking too much about things and just really following what my heart was telling me. Not everyone has to serve, though. There have been exemptions in the past, about 500 of them granted by the Ministry of Culture 
for uh, pianists who've won international competitions or soccer players or baseball players. While the government signs off, exemptions are not always welcomed by the public. There is a very deep strain of egalitarianism in Korean culture. Uh, everybody feels like we're all the, they're all the same. Even though BTS has gone on world tour, one place they likely won't be going in the military is to North Korea. Deterrence is held on the Korean Peninsula for the most part. So I don't really see a scenario in which they would then forced to be forced to go to war. BTS's hiatus from the music world will take a toll on South Korea's economy. A study from the Hyundai Research Institute estimates BTS's contribution to the nation's gross domestic product at $3.6 billion a year. But for many Koreans, equal treatment is more important than lost revenue. BTS is regarded among Koreans as the personification and representation of Korea's global status. And so the notion that these individuals choose to enlist, I think, is a good sign. It's something that will be welcomed by the public. Thanks, Aaron Gilcrest, for that report. And here's some good news for BTS fans. The band's label says they plan to get back together around 2025 after all seven members have completed their service. Coming up, applications are open for President Biden's student loan forgiveness program. But it is facing another legal challenge. We'll explain why and what it means for people who have already applied next. Welcome back. President Biden's federal student loan forgiveness program is facing another legal challenge. A Wisconsin organization promoting taxpayers' rights filed a request asking the Supreme Court to put a stop to the program. Just this week, the administration started accepting applications from borrowers. Joining us now is Michelle B. Goodwin, a professor of law at the University of California, Irvine, and a Georgetown Law visiting professor. Good to have you with us. So help us understand what arguments the group making here, what's it hoping to accomplish by asking the Supreme Court? to get involved. Well, this is a group that has sped its way to the Supreme Court because a federal court judge, a lower court judge, threw out their application to get the law halted. They then appealed to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. They, too, did not provide any relief to this group. The concern is that this is a group that has no standing to bring this lawsuit. In order to have standing in a federal court, you must show that you have experienced some concrete harm. Well, they've not been able to find people who have student loan debt that would be willing to join in this lawsuit. And so what they've done now is to speed their way to the Supreme Court even while the matter is being appealed. This is a tax group that's suggesting that the president doesn't have the authority to issue this type of relief for student loan debt. But the Biden administration um, has found that this is an emergency situation. And the HEROES Act, which went into effect when President Bush was in office after 9-11, specifically provides for uh, this kind of debt relief during a period of emergency. The Biden administration claims that COVID is an emergency. Mm -hmm. And given that we are in a global pandemic, one that we haven't seen in 100 years, it's a very strong case for the Biden administration. So, I mean, in your mind for the Biden administration, what is the best strategy to defend this loan forgiveness program? Well, the first thing is that at least in this instance, this particular task, tax group doesn't actually have standing. So in American jurisprudence, one can't just simply bring a case just because someone doesn't like a particular law that has gone into effect. But you are able to bring litigation if you have standing. That means that you are directly, personally, and concretely affected by this law that has gone into effect. So, for example, if there were a group of individuals who owe um, debt to the federal government through loan programs that they could, in fact, say, we are offended by this. We are somehow hurt by this loan forgiveness program, and we seek to have this program stopped and joined. At least that would help them at the district court level than to begin to issue facts as to how it is that they are harmed. All right, Professor Michelle B. Goodwin, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it.
Thank you so much. We have a follow-up to a story we brought you earlier this week. An elementary school in Missouri is shutting down next week after new tests showed radioactive waste in and around the campus. Now, the district is facing the fallout from frustrated parents as officials scramble to come up with alternative plans. NBC News senior national correspondent Kate Snow has the latest. The Board of Education taking action. The doors at Jenna Elementary outside St. Louis will be shut beginning next week. Students will instead learn remotely due to high levels of radioactive contamination found inside. This is causing a disruption to our students' education. For that, we sincerely apologize. Students will stay remote through the end of the semester. Then they'll be sent to different schools in the district. Many parents expressed relief the school is closing, but also frustration over a lack of communication. My grandchildren has not been back to school since their report hit my phone, and it wasn't from you guys. It was from the news channels. I'm so happy that you all are considering our babies now, but just communicate with us. That's all we want. Jana Elementary sits next to Coldwater Creek. In the 1940s, radioactive bomb waste was dumped nearby and flowed into the water. Earlier this year, the school board decided not to inform parents that it was aware radioactive material had been detected on school property. This board member justifying that decision. If they don't know and they live in that area, then they just have been living under a rock. I don't even live by Coldwater Creek, but I golf up at the golf course that's right on it. And I know the risks, and yet I still golf there. New samples taken in August by an outside group and released last week showed high levels of radioactive lead, not just around the school, but in the kitchen, gym, and library. I first met PTA President Ashley Bernaw over the summer. She pushed the district for years to test inside. Tonight, she's relieved the school will be remediated, but upset it means her son's school community is being split up. It is disappointing to tell him, you know, that he's got two days with his friends. Yeah. We don't know where he'll go after that. She says it's unfortunate her son is paying for the mistakes of past generations. This has started long before either of us were even alive. Ultimately, the kids suffer um, and lose their school community because of bad choices um, from adults just generation after generation, decade after decade. It is infuriating. Kate Snow, NBC News. And now to a new study signaling a shift in the classroom. According to the Education Department, Latinos or the Latinx community will make up nearly 30 percent of the public school population by 2030. That would make them the second largest group of students in the U.S. public school system. But despite the boom in enrollment, some experts say these students do not have what they need to succeed. Amanda Fernandez joins us now to talk about this. She is the founder and CEO of Latinos for Education. Thank you so much for being here, Amanda. So despite that increase in enrollment, as I just talked about, the National Center for Education Statistics found that Latino or Hispanic students saw greater declines in their standardized test scores, which are a big deal for students, compared to their white counterparts. So talk to us about why exactly that is and if anything can be done about it. So as you mentioned, we've seen in the neighborhood of around a 5% decline in standardized tests as we recently saw coming from the nation's scorecard. And so that is cause for alarm. At the same time, these gaps were persistent prior to the pandemic. So while we experienced interrupted learning, uh, these issues were persistent and impacted the Latino community way before the pandemic. So what do we do about that? There are a number of things that school districts can do across the country, as well as families, as well as policymakers. So right now we have uh, one of the biggest uh, inputs of, of federal dollars and state dollars coming into our schools for pandemic relief. And so we are seeing unprecedented numbers of money coming into our districts. And so there are, there are ways in mm. which school communities can be investing more in supporting Latino students with those federal dollars. And Amanda, I'm glad you talked about government funding because we know that public schools rely on state and local funding to operate. But what about states like Texas, where the Latino population makes up more than half of their student population, excuse me, of their population, but they still tend to rank near the bottom when it comes to student spending. So how might that exactly be impacting Latino students and their ability to succeed in school? 
what we typically see in districts that are heavily populated with Latinos is lower, lower numbers of per pupil spending. And so what we need to see is a level of parity for per pupil spending and, and frankly, increased spending because of the higher needs we have and bigger gaps that we have for Latino students. So in states like Texas and other states where we have high populations of Latinos in districts as well as statewide, we need to see a more equitable funding model so that the supports and services for our students and families are at parity hmm. and increased in terms of closing those gaps that we're seeing as a result of the pandemic and even beforehand. Equitable funding, that's an important point to make. And Amanda, I also want to talk about parents now. I know there's a survey by the National School Choice Week it shows that 30% of Hispanic or Hispanic Latino parents are considering full-time homeschooling another public school outside their home district or a public charter school. So can you talk to us about the potential benefits and downfalls of that for parents who maybe can't afford to remove their kids from public school? I know I was a product of public schools. What can they do to help their kids succeed? Right. I was a product of public schools myself. So what we see happening as a result of the pandemic is more parents who have seen more about what the education is that their children are receiving. And they are rethinking what is the best opportunity for my child. And so there is that um, influence because of the pandemic that more parents are rethinking. At the same time, uh, we have the majority of our students in public schools. And so what parents can be doing is really creating a, a space in their schools for their input, advocating a space for them to advocate for their own children, as well as the broader school community. We've typically seen in our schools um, more of a one-way street in terms of uh, the, the relationship between schools and families. The pandemic has opened up an opportunity for there to actually be a two-way street. And it really is imperative now given the levels of information that our families need, yeah. uh, how to support their children and truly be involved and engaged members of the school community. So important. Amanda Fernandez, thank you so much. You're welcome. Coming up, some relief for your wallet. You like the sound of that? You may soon get more money back from your tax refund. We'll explain just how much and why it's all tied to inflation next. Welcome back. Now to financial news where Tesla sees earnings lower than expected. CNBC Savannah Hanau joins us with this and other financial headlines. Savannah, good morning. Hi, guys. Good morning. Yeah, well, Tesla's quarterly earnings beat forecasts, but revenues missed analyst estimates. The company has been struggling to deliver vehicles to customers because of shipping problems. But CEO Elon Musk is trying to brush aside worries about weaker demand, saying Tesla expects to sell every car they can make. Musk also says he's excited about his pending purchase of Twitter, but admits he's overpaying for the company. Musk is pursuing the acquisition after earlier trying to back out of the $44 billion deal. He calls Twitter an asset that has languished for a long time, but the long-term potential is great. And Microsoft is reportedly building a mobile Xbox store to take on Apple and Google. The company revealed details of the plans and filings with UK regulators who are investigating Microsoft's nearly $70 billion acquisition of Activision Blizzard. Microsoft says a big motivation for that deal is to help expand its presence in mobile gaming. Activision makes two massively popular mobile games, Call of Duty Mobile and Candy Crush Saga. The New York Times is dropping plans to launch an app for kids. The Wall Street Journal reports the development comes as the Times has been focusing more on areas beyond news. It's bought the sports media site Athletic, the popular game Wordle, and already has a cooking app and wire cutter, a product recommendation site. But the Times has determined a kids app is no longer a worthwhile investment, guys. 
the wordle is always worthwhile. I right, think. <laughs> no matter <laughs> what <laughs> age you are. No, right. <laughs> yes, Solana, thank you so much. You got it, guys. Let's stay on your money and talk taxes. Soon, many who file their returns might be able to keep a little more cash in their pockets. Yeah, that's right. And it's all because the IRS is making inflation adjustments for the different tax brackets. Here's the key. This change actually starts next year. So what does it mean for you and your refund? Caleb Silver, editor-in-chief at Investopedia, joins us now. Caleb, so these tax adjustments actually happen every year, but with inflation really weighing on everyone's minds, the IRS is now boosting income thresholds for each tax bracket. Explain to us what exactly this means. What's the impact of it? Yeah, and the key word there is adjustment. It's adjusting the tax brackets higher. The amount of income tax, your, your income rate doesn't change, just your adjustment in terms of what you pay on your marginal tax rate. What does that mean? How much you owe for federal income taxes on each portion of your taxable income after the standard deductions. So the standard deductions have also been raised, which means taxpayers are going to be able to keep a little bit more money in the 2023 season. And you touched on standard deductions getting a boost, but give us a little more there. What can the average American expect? Sure, sure. If you're single filing separately, that's another $900 in your pocket, basically. Uh, that goes to $13,850. Uh, if you're married, that's up $1,800, so you get to keep a little bit more. That's now $27,700. $27, and heads of households, that was raised about $1,400 to now $20,800. So a little bit more money, uh, a little bit of relief, but it's trying to keep up with inflation. As you mentioned, they've been adjusting this every year, but because we've had inflation over 8%, you get this massive adjustment, the biggest we've seen since 1985. And there are a few other tax provision adjustments included in next year's. What else can you tell? Yeah, the gift exclusion, that's now $17,000, up from $16,000. The estate tax threshold, if you're passing money down to your heirs, that's now 12.9 million, up from about 12.1 million. Uh, the parents adopting kids, the, the exemption there, up $15,950. That's a raise of about $1,000. And then this one's important too, raising your flex spending, what you can contribute to your flex spending health account pre-tax. The new IRS limit now, $3,050, up 7%, significant for folks because health care costs have been rising ex uh, a lot in the last year, two years. And the key here is that this is next year's taxes, which then you would file in 2024, right? That's right. This doesn't affect 2022. Right. This affects next year. They're raising the limits. They've been doing this since Reagan was president. He made the adjustments so that income could keep up with inflation. All right. Very helpful. Caleb Silver, thank you. Thank you. Coming up, making history on and off the silver screen. One of the first Asian-American film stars is now the first on the U.S. quarter. Up next, a look back at Anna Mae Wong's groundbreaking career and just when you could get one of the coins for yourself. You're watching Morning News Now. We are now less than a month away from this year's Christmas Spectacular put on by the Radio City Rockettes and preps are underway. In addition to those famous high kicks, the dance troupe is adding an all-new number, Dance of the Frost Fairies. The new routine includes fairy drones that will dance above the audience, which organizers say will turn Radio City into a magical winter wonderland. The Radio City Rockettes Christmas Spectacular opens November 18th and runs through January 2nd. We were saying if we weren't seated right now, we would, of course, be doing of course. high kicks. High kicks for you early really? in the morning. <laughs> Seeing that makes me want to stretch, though, I have to admit. Like, I'm, like, I'm feeling a little tight. A little like, not ready for high kicks yet? No. <laughs> but I am ready for the holiday season. Yes. I love all that. I know. It's coming so, quick. Yes, that's right. And finally, this hour, making history. First in Hollywood and now the U.S. Mint. The first Chinese-American movie star is still blazing a path for minorities six decades after her passing. Actress Anna Mae Wong will soon be featured on The Quarter, making her the first Asian-American on U.S. currency. NBC News correspondent Emily Ikeda has the story. One of the first Asian-Americans to dazzle Hollywood's silver screen is now the first to grace U.S. currency. An estimated half a billion quarters will soon pay tribute to Anna Mae Wong, who landed her first acting role at just 14 years old in 1919 and went on to star in TV, radio, theater, and movies. But the new coin pays tribute to more than her decades of success. It also honors her struggle in an era when yellow face and laws criminalizing interracial relationships ran rampant. There were certain images, especially of Asian women, that were constantly and falsely being promoted on screen. The way she fought back was through her talent as an actor. The third generation American paved the way for other Asian American actors like Lucy Liu, who received a star on the Walk of Fame next to Wong's. So a hundred years ago, 
she was a pioneer while enduring racism, marginalization, and exclusion. Wong's elegance on screen now etched into the quarter with a close-up of her unmistakable face resting on her manicured hand. And on the flip side will be George Washington. But this version of the founding father is designed by a woman for the first time in history. The power of U.S. currency is that it really exemplifies and shows to everyday citizens what we value as a nation. The U.S. Mint will begin rolling out Wong's quarters starting Monday, all part of a four-year effort to honor female trailblazers on coins, including poet Maya Angelou and astronaut Dr. Sally Ride, as their legacies continue to inspire change. Emily Iketa, NBC News. So cool to see all those quarters that yeah. are coming out. I can't wait to get one. Yeah, there you go. I've never been so excited to get it a quarter. Are you going to spend it or are going to keep Ooh, it? I think mm, I can keep it. Yeah. Maybe frame it. Yeah, there you go. All right. <laughs> wow. All right. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.